Hi everyone, I'm Krika and this is Art Rendezvous. Welcome to episode 7. I'm so excited to introduce you to our first guest tonight, Jennifer Hill, who is a ceramic artist and creates stunning sculptures from simple clay. So let's welcome Jennifer on the show. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Krika. Welcome to Art Rendezvous. Thank you. Would you describe your style? How do you describe your style as a ceramic artist? Um, well, I, um, I would say my major influences are nature-based, especially plant life and sea life in particular. So um, I usually draw the idea of texture and form from those things without necessarily trying to interpret in a realistic way. So I'm more of an abstractionist, I would say. Okay. Um, so I, what I was thinking is not everyone can work with clay as it's not an easy medium to work with because uh, it's, it's hard to get resu desired results out of, out of clay. Uh, so why, would, why did you choose um, to work with clay in the first place? You know, it's funny because I really didn't start working in art until I decided to um, pursue a degree in it. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, you know, I always wanted to be an art major when I started college, but I kind of kept putting it to the side and eventually decided to make it my focus. And I went through all the usual foundational classes, you know, doing drawing, painting, 2D design, and eventually 3D design. And that was the class that really kicked me over to the side of things that I was you know, looking to do. It was basically introduction to sculpture. And so I realized I was more interested in working in three dimensions. And, um, and clay was the one other class that would be the you know, clear choice to take if you wanted to work three dimensionally, you know, besides you know, a little um, sampling of everything else. So I tried out clay and I just fell in love with it like so many people do. Yeah, so, so after taking all those classes, what was your journey like to become a professional artist after that? Well, I went ahead and finished my um, undergraduate degree and I went on to do a couple more university related things, a post-baccalaureate post and a graduate study as well. So um, that, that's how I kind of finished figuring out that I was going to work in this medium. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I really am, um, you know, a cosmic student in the sense that, you know, learning from a teacher or in a class situation is the way that I gain knowledge. Um, so, uh, like, did you, did you travel uh, during your studies or, uh, or, you know, did res residencies and stuff um, to, to gain more, more perspective to what kind of ceramic artist you wanted to be? Yeah, what I did is I, um, when I did my first degree, um, it's very common in universities, even when they're really large and have a sizable art department to have maybe as few as one to three professors in this medium. Mm -hmm. And so I decided the best thing to do was to go to, to multiple universities while I was studying. So I you know, went to um, in my hometown, I went to SMU in Dallas, and then I went to University of Florida for a post-baccalaureate, and then I went to Utah State University for graduate. So I just decided also being in different regions of the country would help to, you know, give me more experience as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really did, you know, kind of broaden my scope. And then I was fortunate after school to be able to do a few things like a residency in Pennsylvania. And, uh, and then I was able to move to Oregon in order to start teaching. So a lot of interesting things along the way. Um, and so, so you're a professional teacher as well, right? That's correct, yeah. Uh, and where do you teach now? At the moment, I teach um, mostly at the, art, the Contemporary Austin Art School at Laguna Gloria, or most people just call it Laguna Gloria. <laughs> it's pretty well known that way. It's and beautiful. Yeah, it's a great place to teach. It's, um, you know, the grounds are lovely and I love being there in person. At the moment, I'm teaching online through them. So at least we're still connected, <laughs> you know, until we can be in, per in person again. And um, I've also been teaching at the Doherty Art Center. Yeah. Uh, 
Michigan, which is through the city of Austin. Um, how is it like to do the online classes? Um, I mean, I, it's probably really hard to teach 3D, uh, 3D art by online classes, right? Right. It's a, it's kind of funny because in live classes, I always kind of jokingly say that we're here to be three dimensional, you know, and so <laughs> that's why we're here together as a community, you know, taking classes and learning with each other. But, um, you know, at least we can still do something, you know, it's, it may not be ideal for our medium, but yeah. it's so much, you know, it's, I hate clay, if they're, if they happen to be new to it, it does kind of bring everyone to a similar level really fast. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, you know, when it's new to you, it's new. And um, even if you do have an art background in other media. Um, do you have any uh, fun stories from your classroom? Oh, I would say one of the things that I often think about is um, one of my night classes was at the end of the week on a Thursday, and I always had no trouble getting people to sign up for that. And, uh, but then when I was trying to do a night class earlier in the week, it would be really slow to fill in. And I would think, well, if the other one's full, surely they want to come you know, to the one that has some space. And so I would kind of interview people and ask, um, what makes you, you know, what made you decide to take this class? And, you know, why did you choose this particular time? And um, one of the students just put it the most clearly by saying, you know, I just, you know, I like my job, but I just need something to look forward to at the end of the week. <laughs> uh, I see some of the pieces that you have in the, in the back and uh, those look so inspired by, by the sea. And what, what, in, what inspired you to make the, these kind of art pieces? Yeah, well, they're a long and slow evolution of work because um, a lot of the things that I'm making have been um, happening for years and um, they're constantly changing a little bit. You can see from the images, some of my influences are really familiar and some of them are a little more obscure. That little tiny sea cucumber is only about an inch long. And uh, so, and I have the combination of images because I'm often looking at assorted things to get to one result and, um, or a series of results, I should say, because, you know, maybe, you know, I saw that prickly little sea cucumber and then I saw this ginger plant that was growing and it had these layers that overlapped and it also had a little bit of, you know, that texture. And then I saw something else and then they all kind of, yeah, stick with me and brew together for a while until they become a piece. So I'll go ahead and call it that, but it's really an abstraction of several forms. Where is that, that inspiration drawn from? Well, like the image that had several of them in it, those became little closed um, urchins where before I had open ones that were in the form of a, a small vessel, like a cup. And uh, I kind of, you know, jokingly they call them a cup in the sense that they're really hard to hold, <laughs> you know, but they have this interior space. Mm -hmm. And I often think about the contrast between the interior and the exterior, how, you know, you may have a smooth, cozy, safe interior, and then this prickly shell, you know, that keeps everything out. And so, it, you know, a lot of times um, sea creatures and plants, they have their own shelter, you know, in the way that they create themselves. And so I thought, you know, sometimes like in reference to the little hive here, um, you know, it definitely has like this smooth open interior that you just can't even see, you know, only, only the creature that belongs in there gets to know about it. <laughs> you know, when I was thinking that uh, we live in Austin, Texas, and there is no sea nearby, and so, so why are why are you so influenced by the sea? Yeah, it's funny because I am um, a Texan, and so you know I'm used to not seeing these things in real life. But I had the opportunity to live in Hawaii for about five years on the island of Kauai, which is also known as the Garden Isle, and mm -hmm. so um, it had that perfect blend of things that I really love to look at, things that were influencing me before I saw them in person even. And, um, you know, both the, the outrageously wonderful botanical life and then, of course, sea life, you know, from going um, snorkeling and a little bit of scuba diving as well. And so, you know, I like that certainly from here as well. So, um, yeah, it's a better way to be able to see family more often, you know, because it's, it's, pricey for either one of us to travel back or forth. Oh, so. yeah. 
Uh, yeah, family always trumps. <laughs> um, and so uh, I had seen some of your images of um, of these uh, octopus uh, plant holders. Uh, it looked like the octopus tentacles, plant holders. Are those uh, in when? When did you make those and what was the inspiration for that? Well, that's funny that I started making them more recently because they were inspired by pieces like the sprouting one next to me. And um, those I had been doing, these sculptures, you know, that are completely, um, you know, just abstractions, you know, for just years and years and off and on. And I was thinking about how much I enjoy making the tendrils, you know, the tentacle like tendrils. And I was kind of just wanting to translate them into something more accessible because mm -hmm. I am at heart, I'm a potter and I do like to make functional pieces that people can really hold in their hands and use. Yeah. And so what I decided to do is make those into little wall bases. And so they have a little bit of space that you can put water in and put a flower and they hang on the wall. And I've sold them, you know, at various um, events that I've been at and they were pretty popular you know, because they are, they're you know, affordable and they resemble the type of work I do without having to commit to a full sculpture. Yeah. Um, would you describe the process a little bit of, uh, of, of making these pieces? Sure. Um, the ones that are built little uh, with lots of small pieces like this hive and barnacle piece over here those are all made with soft clay that's fresh and i have like a um i just start with a thin slab of clay and roll it up so it looks like a little cinnamon stick or something like that on some of the forms and sometimes they're rolled in different shapes like the barnacles are a little more of a teardrop shape and each one is laid out on a preliminary surface and they're just layered and layered, just like building a little house, you know, and, and the vessel is built from the bottom to the top. So there's no pre-made vessel with things stuck on, but instead they grow and generate as they go to the top, which is more like, you know, nature itself, you know, a plant generates, you know, petal after petal or leaf after leaf, or sea life is always like coral is always generating outward, you know, and growing, you know, larger and, um, and directionally. So yeah. it's meant to, you know, both the making process as well as the end result are meant to resemble the things that I'm looking at. I, let's see if we can pull, pull up those images again and, and put it up on the screen. Yeah, so that one is, you know, it kind of, you can see the back of the shape of that um, barnacle, each little barnacle bit, as I call it. Um, it's laid and the clay is still soft enough to pinch each level to the level before. So that's why the interior looks as if it was just a smooth vessel in the end, but the exterior has this whole other look, but they actually are built just like a little brick house, you know, brick by brick. Yeah. Um, and, and the piece that you have on, on the table behind with the, which has the tentacles, it almost has a, a glass look to it, the sharpness and the, the look and the shininess of the glass. Of a, like a glass piece. So how, how do you get that? Yeah, I think especially if it's farther away, it's a little bit of an illusion um, because it, it's a porcelain clay body. And the reason that it kind of has that um, surface is I'm using a, a material called terra sigillata. And terra sigillata is just a really fancy word <laughs> for a very, very fine clay slip, which is just a liquefied clay. And I can put it on the piece um, after I've made it and it's relatively dry. And then I can hand polish it called burnishing. And it makes it look almost as if the, the little bit of color, this one has a little bit of blue to the body um, or white on the top. And that little bit of um, tone looks more like it's part of the skin, you know, instead of being added on like a glaze would typically look a little more like it's on the surface where this just looks like it is the surface. I uh, know that you traveled to or did a residency in Rome uh, for some time. What was that experience like? Uh, I feel really fortunate because it was last year. <laughs> and so I went when I was able to. And um, it was a five-week residency at an art center called Creta Rome. 
and it was just great. It was it was completely self-directed. Um, the studio was available constantly, and I could work whenever I needed to, and I could go out and see museums and um, see the sites in between. So I just, uh, you know, I, I couldn't have had it any better. <laughs> you know, it was just a wonderful experience. And it was nice because it culminated in a, a brief gallery show at the end. So we could make work, you know, it was with a couple other artists that were also in residence at the time. And um, we had a little show at the end. And so it was very satisfying as, a, as an experience. It's just great. And I do see some, uh, some images of produce in there again. <laughs> so I feel like um, you had some inspiration from the produce in Rome as well. That's so true. I, you know, you would think it would be all the amazing artwork I was seeing at the museums, but then I'd go to the farmer's market and, and take lots of pictures and, and go, oh, this is just what I've been looking for, you know. <laughs> But these restaurants that would have like that stack of artichokes that were just gorgeous. I mean, they just made even the, you know, the un, the raw uncooked food was just so beautiful to look at. And I just love the way that people made just every little thing and a piece of artwork. <laughs> I would have never thought that you go to Rome and you get inspired by produce to make your sculptures. <laughs> that is hilarious. But they are, they are gorgeous. I mean, and, you know, inspiration ca can come from anywhere. <laughs> yeah, you can't deny who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, Jennifer, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kritka. I appreciate it. And it's time to introduce you to our second guest tonight. His name is Charles Santora. Charles has a knack of capturing everyday routine moments and turning them into beautiful art piece. So let's welcome Charles. Hi, Charles. Hi, Krista. How are you? Good. Welcome to Art Rendezvous. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. So Charles, how long have you been doing photography and um, how did you start? Uh, I've been doing uh, photography for maybe 10 years, um, but I started to get really serious back in around 2014. Um, I, to be honest with you, how did I start? I, I had a very stressful job and I I needed an outlet um, to relieve the stress and I just kind of fell in love with it more and more. And then I just started to do it part-time while I worked on my full-time job. Um, and now I'm doing it full-time. Um, you know, I, I don't know much about uh, photography and all I know is how to use my phone and take pictures, right? And that's it, <laughs> that's the extent <laughs> of it. Uh, so 
Would you tell, uh, would you talk a little bit more about it and specifically about the fine art uh, photography? How is it different from the regular? Uh, sure. Um, so fine art photography, there's, it, there's no strict definition uh, on what fine art photography is. There's many different interpretations. Um, but one that I um, adhere to, or the way I can explain it, the way it means to me, is that it's um, a phot photograph that has meaning and emotion. Mm -hmm. And so I, in all of my photographs, I try to create a story within the photo. And so I go out and, and capture that photograph with a story. And then there's, um, there's intent, when I process the photo, I'm intentionally creating uh, an, an image that has, you know, that story within it and that emotion, the drama within the photo. And then I think for me, that image is then put onto like gallery quality materials. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a metal print, it could be a canvas gallery wrap, a fine art archival paper inside of a frame, or it could be like an acrylic print where the the print is actually sandwiched between a piece of plexiglass and a piece of aluminum. So the way it's presented, so it's like this whole process of going out and shooting the photograph, you're, you're planning it, there's intent to create a scene, and then you process it, and then you put it on, onto like, a, like a, um, a gallery substrate that you can hang on your wall. So that's the way I would, um, that's the way I would summarize fine art photography. Um. So what I'm thinking is for, for most people, just uh, taking a photo is that's it. Um, and for you, it's, it's, it's the starting canvas. That's where you start and then you it may evolve from there and make it an art piece. It's just- Actually, it, goes, it actually goes back even be earlier than that, Krika. It's where it's actually, I'm planning, um, I'm planning a photograph, which mm -hmm. could be 3000 miles away. Mm -hmm. So, I'm looking at the weather, how that's gonna impact uh, different vantage points of the scene that I wanna shoot. So a lot of the photography I do is urban photography. So I might look at how, how does the, like what time of the day should I be there? You know, what equipment do I need in order to deal with the sun? Um, do I need a tripod? How many, what type of lens do I need? And then I take that with me. So it starts in the very beginning, the planning stages at home. And then I go and then I shoot the shot and then I come back and then I look at it on a computer, I process it, and then I send that image to the, my print lab and then my print lab creates um, the final piece that you would hang on your wall. And so what fascinates you uh, about this? What, what fascinates you most about this, this field, working in this field? Well, I think it's the challenge. Um, you know, I mentioned the weather you know, where's the sun going to be at a certain part of the day or, you know, what kind of cloud formations are we going to have? Um, so the weather is a big challenge for me. Um, and then, you know, when you get to a certain location, you just never know what you're going to see. Um, is it going to be crowded? Are there going to be too many people there? Um, are they going to be in the way? Can you use the people to tell part of the story? So it's just sort of the unknown. Um, sometimes I go and I might travel into a city I might spend one day there. If I come back with one photo that I'm proud of and I kind of want to move it along to send it to a print lab, I would be very happy with that. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I might come back with maybe 10, 10 images that I really like and I'm proud of. But, you know, a lot of times it's, it could be just one or two. So it's the challenge. It's just, there's so many unknowns. So, um, so the scene uh, is always unpredictable. It's, it's out of your control. And so how do you gauge um, that what now is the scene for my perfect click? Uh, you know, when all everything falls in the place and you're like, okay, now, um, now this is the scene I want to capture. Okay, yeah, so there's four things that I, like four rules that I follow for myself. Uh, one is location, okay? Um, say I went to um, Paris and I wanted to shoot the Eiffel Tower, okay? And then the composition. How do I want to capture the Eiffel Tower in such a way that's unique and different from the way everybody else will capture the Eiffel Tower? And then there's light. You know, how, what time of the day should I be there to shoot the Eiffel Tower? Should it be in the morning? Should it be in the afternoon? Should it be in the evening? Um, 
And then the last part, which is very important to my stories is the human element. Mm -hmm. um, I like to have people many times in my photos because it adds, um, it, it just adds life to the image, right? So we all can relate to life. Um, a lot of times I feel like images without life in it, it's a little bit stagnant. So, but if I can add people into my photography, then it just kind of gives it life and energy. And really this, for me, it's always trying to capture the soul of the city. So the soul for me, you'd have to have people in it. And, and most of your work that I've noticed here is, is black and white. So uh, why take the color out of it? I mean, I, I love how it looks, but I'm just wondering why take the color out? Um, well, a lot of my photography is in the city, right? I said earlier, I shoot a lot of urban scenes. And if you're in the city, there's just so much going on. There's, you might have billboards, you might have hundreds of people walking around, you have all the different stores and you have their, you might have their signs like, um, you know, with the different colors. It's hard to, it's hard for me to relate my story through that image if it's in color. So if I make it black and white, it's sort of, tones everything down and then that way the viewer can immediately see the story that i'm trying to tell it's sort of an amazing thing mm -hmm. um, when you switch an image from color to black and white mm -hmm. um, so and i i love black and white because um i love the timeless element of a black and white photo mm -hmm. and i love how a black and white photo looks so it's sometimes with a little simple black frame around it mm -hmm. um yeah so and then I do like color as well. Uh, so as I said earlier, I like, I love to tell stories through my photos and sometimes color is a big part of the story. So when you do see images that I have as prints in color, it's because the color is a big part of that story. Um, you know, uh, when I, I'm looking at those images, I, I know that they belong to this world, but the story that you're telling uh, and the way it's projected in your images, it looks so much more cooler that I want to be part of that world. <laughs> I want to have, have an experience of that as well. <laughs> well, you're welcome to be part of that world anytime. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what are the different places that you have traveled? So I've been to Dublin, Ireland, uh, London, Paris, uh, Cairo, Egypt, uh, Wuhan, China. Um, I've been to many cities here in the US, um, Los Angeles, New York, um, Philadelphia, uh, Portland, Seattle. So a bunch of different cities I've been to. Um, a, lot of my, a lot of my art prints are, have, take, have taken place in those, in those places. Uh, do you have a favorite place where you like to go most and and take images, like if you have to travel to any of these places again, wh which one is your favorite? Uh, that's that? easy. New York City. New York City. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love, I love New York City. I love the, um, sometimes I can go to New York City without even having a plan. I just wanna go and walk around for 12 hours, just look down the different alleyways and some of the grimy streets and see if there's any, there's a story to be told. Um, because I'm always looking for things where, um, you know, most people might not see it as something that is um, even worth looking at, but um, I see it as inspiring and, and potentially beautiful. And I, that's what I try to do. Like I capture things that people won't even notice and then bring it, bring it alive in, in my photography. And New York has a lot of that. So that's why I say yeah. New York. Yeah. And, and the image that you have in the back, um, and next to you, is that from New York or where is that from? Uh, this is actually from Seattle. Seattle. Uh, yeah, but this is a, a grimy street, <laughs> a small little narrow grimy street. And I happened to stumble upon this um, facade and I just kind of fell in love with it. I knew I could do something with it, um, but I waited for the, I waited for people to walk by because I wanted to get that human element. And, um, it, you know, the story with this is that this is an angel and it's called angelic stare. So the angel is sort of looking out and is always looking out over, over top of everybody, looking out for everyone. So, and no matter where you are, it could be a grimy street, right? With dilapidated lights on the building, or, you know, it's like a dirty facade and it's got graffiti, a broken door. Um, 
but the angel is always going to look over everyone. And, and I needed to have a, a person in the scene in order to kind of finish to complete that story. Just curious how long you had to wait for that person to walk by. <laughs> uh, so there were several people that walked by, but I was, um, I was waiting for just kind of the right, the right person for me. Um, and this took about, tw about a half hour I waited. But while I was doing that, I was, um, you know, sizing up my composition and where I wanted to stand. And um, so I kept myself busy, but I've waited, I've waited even longer to get the right shot, you know, upwards of an hour or two hours in order to get the right shot. That is, that is imp impressive. And, and I guess it takes a lot of patience of, for, you know, and, um, why, when you were tra talking about all the different places that you've traveled, you mentioned Wuhan, China, and and that um, I was wondering uh, why Wuhan, China, because most mostly when people travel to China, Wuhan is not the city that uh, <laughs> like could, would have gone or have mentioned it. Um, but I mean, it's been really, uh, you know, it's being talked about a lot lately, not for the right reasons. Uh, right. So I'm just curious about wh why you why you traveled to Wuhan and what was your experience there? Yeah, so um, back in 2018, um, this is about the anniversary, 40th anniversary of the Chinese government investing billions and billions of dollars into their infrastructure and trying to make Wuhan an up and coming international city. And mm -hmm. so it was the 40th anniversary and what they what they did was they brought over a handful of American photographers to photograph the city through the lens of an American photographer um, because they could have they could have had their own Chinese photographers you know take photos of their city but they wanted it they wanted to see what would the what would a, how would an American photographer portray the city of Wuhan um, so I was over there for about a week and a half and. Um, it was an amazing experience because I got to go through all these different parts of the city, capturing the old and the, the old versus the new, the traditional versus the modern. Because mm -hmm. you know Wuhan, like a lot of Chinese cities, they have so much historical uh, mm -hmm. places within the city, but they've also developed all this infrastructure, arenas, bridges, roadways, and um, so yeah. So I got to do that in 2018, and then in 2019. They asked me to come back, so I went back to um, to shoot more of the city because the city of Wuhan is a city of 11 million people, mm -hmm. and it's one of the largest cities in the world in terms of land area. So there's, we've got to shoot half of the city in 2018 and the other half in 2019, um, and then those photographs they were put into a gallery in 2018 and a 2019 over in Wuhan, and then they moved to the San Francisco Public Library in both years as well. Um, I was um, I was looking at the images. Uh, let's see if we can bring them back on the screen. And if you can talk specifically about those images that we have here. And this is an image of the, of the couple standing outside the church. Yeah, I call this one bunny love. And it was a, a couple, they were getting married and um, they were just standing around and then I had an opportunity to take the photo of them where they were standing right in front of this old historic building. So mm -hmm. for me, this image is about, um, it's about the new, the new generation, the younger generation in Wuhan um, coexisting with the old. So there's these, you know, they're, they're like a hip couple, they're dressed, you know, kind of funky and, and very interesting. Um, so that's that's the that's the story with that particular image. Oh, cool. Um, and then there is another one uh, of the dancer in there. I think uh, with her all makeup. Uh, I was uh, backstage. Uh, that's an opera singer, and I was able to be backstage with her while she was uh, putting her makeup on. So I got to see her the entire transformation of her makeup from the very beginning all the way to the end, and when I got, so this, this shot, I was sitting next to her and she finished putting her makeup on and I asked the, my interpreter, hey, can you have her turn her face toward me? And then when she turned her face toward me, I took the shot. And she doesn't even have her outfit for the opera on, that's just a t-shirt, but her, make, her 
their face is, is, is finished putting her makeup. It took about two hours for her to put her makeup on. And she had like two or three helpers. Uh, these uh, these images definitely cap capture the festivity and liveliness of Wuhan. And um, after hearing what you told that they have been preparing to make Wuhan as a, as a big city and wanted to welcome tourists, I, I feel really sad like what happened with the pandemic and it's going to take them a while to recover from this. I, I agree. It's going to take, uh, it's going to take quite a few years um, for people to, I don't know if anyone will ever forget, but to people, for people to trust, they can go, they can go to not only Wuhan, but to China, right? right. Um, yeah, and it's, it's really sad because, you know, the people there, they're just, full, they're so wonderful. They're so warm and so welcoming. I haven't been to any city in the world where I could actually take people's photographs on the street mm -hmm. without them getting, being offended. So they would smile and you know, say, hey, why, why would you want to take a picture of me? But then they would smile. And if they had children, they would want me to take photos of their children, which you don't see that anywhere, uh, that any place that I've been either. So it was just, a, they're such a warm people. So they don't really deserve um, that has the reputation that they're getting today. So I hope it passes. I hope so too. Um, and I noticed that you did not mention any um, Austin in your work, and I, I don't see any Austin gallery, <laughs> you know, <laughs> listed in your work. So why is that? Uh, well, I'm working on an Austin series. Um, I've, I have a few Austin photographs. I haven't published them yet, but mm -hmm. I'm working to build up an entire series uh, where I'm capturing the soul of Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because of the pandemic. I had started the project at the beginning of the year and just it just got it started. And then the pandemic came and I put it on the back burner. But it's definitely like once I get out, start shooting after this pandemic, I'm going to finish. I'm going to pick up where I left off. But Austin is, is my next project. I'm looking forward yeah. to uh, when you have that gallery up for Austin. Uh, I am too. <laughs> I will invite you. Awesome. Uh, Charles, thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Rick. I really appreciate it. It was, it was fun. Thank you.
that was our show for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe our channel, Art Rendezvous. We'll be back soon with more art inspiring stories. Until then, stay safe and don't forget to wash your hands. Bye.